Thanks, Richard. Um, so I wasn't going to say this before Peter's talk this morning, but I have a conflict of interest to declare. I eat red meat. That's it. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about red meat and cancer. It's a topic that comes up in my clinic quite a bit, working as a GP who sees patients for low carbohydrate nutrition advice. Um, and given that the vast majority of low carb eaters eat some red meat, it's probably relevant to most of you here today as well. So as just mentioned, uh, red meat as a food source is constantly under siege. This is just a selection of some of our local media headlines in the last year or two showing some pretty grim predictions. And on the right you can see red meat makes up a smaller and smaller proportion of what we're told we should eat if you want to stay healthy. So why is red meat worth defending? Well, simply put, it's a nutritional powerhouse. It's loaded full of protein, essential amino acids, uh, several vitamins, and is a good source of uh, trace elements such as iron, zinc, selenium. It also has a source of fat, uh, which we need to absorb several fat-soluble vitamins. <coughs> so this diagram shows a pyramid of, of scientific evidence in terms of quality. So basically, the further up you go the pyramid, the more scientifically rigorous the data gets. Unfortunately, because cancer happens over many years, it's a process that often takes decades to, to occur, most of our data on red meat and cancer comes from observational studies, so cohort studies or case series studies. You can take a bunch of these studies and put them together and collate them into a meta-analysis or a systematic review to see whether there was a bigger effect than initially thought, and that's what's, what's been done in the past, and I'll talk about that today. The problem with doing that is you miss all of the experimental data in the middle, so in, in particular the randomised control trial, which in medicine we generally see as the gold standard for a single study. Epidemiological stu studies also have several other limitations, so they can infer correlation but not causation. So, just because Nicolas Cage is doing more films one year compared to another doesn't mean he's drowning people in the pool. Well, not necessarily, maybe. We'll never know. There are other confounders that are not accounted for as well. So, say we find that red meat eaters are less healthy. It might be because they smoke more or they drink more or they're less active. It might not necessarily be because of the red meat. And the data collection in these studies is often of low quality as well. And above all else, placing too much faith in these studies has led to mistakes in the past. So you only need to think back to antioxidants and vitamins or cholesterol in eggs or the other current dietary battleground of saturated fat and heart disease to know that when we jump the gun too early, we can make some mistakes. So speaking of data collection, this is a typical food questionnaire that might be used in one of the studies that I'll show today. So in essence, the participants are asked to, to rate how often they eat all these foods uh, over the last year. So anywhere from less than once a month all the way to six times a day. And often it's done at day one in these studies and might not be done again for another 10 years. And essentially then they're just averaged out. So you can see how that might not be particularly accurate. And I'm sure there are people in the room today who would have a very different questionnaire than what they might have had a year or two ago. So with that being said, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or the IARC, which is a, a part of the WHO, is tasked with assessing what's carcinogenic to humans. In the past, they've tackled over a thousand compounds and factors and basically put them into one of these groups, ranging from carcinogenic down to probably not carcinogenic to humans. In 2015, they tackled red meat and processed red meat, and they found that processed red meat was a group one carcinogen. So that's in the same category as asbestos, tobacco, mustard gas, and various nuclear fuels like plutonium. So <laughs> pretty esteemed company. <laughs> Plain red meat was uh, classified as category 2A. So that's a more eclectic group of things such as benzyl chloride and various other industrial chemicals, <laughs> malaria, and interestingly, being a hairdresser or being a shift worker. So they released a report in 2015, and oh, sorry, a press release in 2015, and a full report was actually released earlier this year. The press release at the time in 2015 stated that the consumption of red meat was probably carcinogenic to humans based on limited evidence that the consumption of red meat causes cancer in humans and strong mechanistic evidence supporting a carcinogenic effect. This was mainly found for colorectal cancer. In the full report, there's some lesser associations for prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, and they don't mention, but also a little bit for stomach cancer and lung cancer, but the vast majority of the, the recommendation was focused on colorectal cancer, so that's what I'll focus on today. Processed meat was classified as carcinogenic based on sufficient evidence that it causes colorectal cancer. Now, for their report, they classified red meat as any mammalian muscle meat, including beef, veal, pork, lamb, mutton, horse or goat. And it's important to note that the difference between red meat and white meat is essentially the, the degree of myoglobin in the muscle fibre, so that's what differentiates chicken from 
red meat essentially in their classification. Processed meat refers to any meat that had been transformed through salting, curing, fermentation, smoking or other processes to enhance its flavour or improve its preservation. And they list a couple of examples there, but there are many others. So let's look at the evidence. They quoted 14 cohort studies that they used to determine whether red meat causes colorectal cancer. So just to reiterate, a cohort study is a study where you prospectively follow up a big bunch of people, um, take some baseline data on, uh, on day one, and then follow them up over the years. And then at the end, you determine who got the disease you're looking at and who didn't, and whether there's any factors that might discriminate the two groups. So eight out of the 14 studies showed no link at all. Five out of the 14 studies showed a small trend towards colorectal cancer being more likely in red meat eaters that was so small that they couldn't statistically say that it was definitely true, so that it wasn't just statistical noise. And one out of 14, I'll repeat that, one out of 14 studies showed a, a positive link between colorectal cancer and red meat. And what it found is that the relative risk of getting colorectal cancer if you ate red meat more than once a week compared to someone who was a non-meat eater was 1.85. So you were 1.85 times more likely to get colorectal cancer if you ate red meat more than once a week. Now this study is interesting. This is a study of Adventists in America, a cohort of Adventists, which as we heard this morning, a lot of them are vegetarian due to um, religious reasons. So this study had an unusually high proportion of vegetarians. It also included people who ate red meat and they tended to be more unhealthy. So they drank more, they smoked more, and they were more overweight. The people who wrote the study found a subset of their population who were particularly high risk, who, ha who had a high red meat intake, a low legume intake, and were obese. And in this population, the risk of colorectal cancer was particularly high, so greater than three times as, high as uh, likely to get colorectal cancer. We're going to come back to this study later. With processed red meat, it's even harder to make sense of the data because all processed, red meat, uh, all processed food is linked to cancer, potentially. And there was a study that came out this year in Europe suggesting that. And the other thing is processed meat is often eaten with other processed foods, such as sugary buns, sugary sauces, and sugary soft drinks. And you also end up in this weird situation in the data where traditional cured meats, which are often just meat, salt, and curing agents, are put in the same category as fast food burgers, processed hot dogs, and commercial beef jerky, which is often up to 20% sugar. And the other thing is, again, processed red meat eaters tend to, eat, uh, to smoke more, to drink more, and to, to exercise less. So they're less health conscious in general, and you could make the case, as some have done, that processed meat intake is a marker of bad health rather than a maker of bad health. That being said, the IARC looked at 18 studies uh, looking at processed red meat and colorectal cancer and found that 12 of the 18 showed no statistically significant correlation. Six out of 18 showed a statistically significant correlation, although two of those only found it in males. Now, at the end of all that, the IARC quotes a meta-analysis of colorectal cancer, which included 10 cohort studies, so they grouped all of these patients together. And what they reported was there was a statistically significant dose-response relationship between red meat and colorectal cancer. So uh, basically a 17% increased relative risk, or a relative risk of 1.17 per 100 grams per day of red meat. And for processed meat, it was an 18% risk, so relative risk of 1.18 per 50 grams per day of processed red meat. Now, it's important to note that in epidemiology, a, a relative risk of less than two is considered fairly weak and certainly open to potential confounders and bias. And if we just think about lung cancer and tobacco smoke, which has been our, historically our great success story in cancer epidemiology, the relative risks in those studies, if you look at them, are between 10 and 30. So they're way, way, way above 1.18. The other thing you need to do if you find a correlation between a potential carcinogen and a cancer is you'd have to be able to explain how it could possibly cause cancer. So the IARC put forth uh, several proposed mechanisms. The first one was heme iron. So heme iron is a compound found in humans and mammals, uh, basically in the red blood cell, which is attached, and it's attached to the hemoglobin molecule, you can see here on the, on the right. The potential mechanisms by which it might cause cancer include a direct action on the clonic cells, a formation of N-nitroso compounds, which I'll come to in a second, and oxidation of polyunsaturated fats during the cooking process. So when you look at the data they quote, it's mainly rat studies. There's not really any human studies done. And in those initial rat studies, those rats were fed blood sausage, which surprisingly has a lot of blood in it and has a very high heme intake. So it's not really typical of the average human meat 
intake. These rats in these initial studies were also not given any calcium, so they were very calcium deficient rats. Um, and on subsequent studies, when they did the same thing but supplemented calcium for these rats, they found that the risk completely vanished. So if you're a calcium deficient rat, watch out for heme, but for the rest yeah. of us, um, it's far from a slam dunk case against heme iron. The second thing they looked at is the chemicals that can occur during the cooking process. So the first of these is heterocyclic amines. Uh, they're present in a variety of foods and looking at the data, they may have a very minor role in animal models at very high doses. And it's very hard to, to, to see how relevant that would be to humans because in these studies, they're often having 100,000 times higher doses of this than we would get in our diet. The other thing is chicken is a, quite a high source of this and chicken is not associated with colorectal cancer in these epidemiological studies. So the mechanism doesn't fully fit. The second group of compounds they suggested were the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which again are produced in, um, in various foods, in particular if the foods are heated at high heat over a naked flame. So in essence, if you're cooking some meat and the fat comes off the, the meat and falls into the fire, these gaseous compounds get formed, which can then quickly stick to the body of the meat uh, when they're, 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 they're uh, ingested afterwards. So if you've heard advice in the past about not charring your meat or having it well done, that's where it comes from. At the same time, if people are really serious about this, then we'd be getting advice to never eat toast or to not toast our grains because they're also sources of all these compounds. The third group they mention is the N-nitroso compounds. So again, this is a diverse group of compounds which are found in, in various foods, including vegetables and meat in our water supply. And we actually recycle these compounds in our saliva. They can also be found in the form of added nitrites in processed meat, where they use as a curing agent, as a colouring agent, and in this way they can end up in the gut and act as a potential increasing, uh, increased source of uh, nitrous oxide. Heme uh, appears to interact with the gut to produce more of these N-nitroso compounds, and while they're there, they can potentially act as alkylating agents and cause DNA damage on the colonic cells. Once again, rats are not an ideal model. Uh, the rat microbiome is not the same as the human microbiome. Rats don't recycle these compounds in their saliva, so they're not the ideal vessel for studying these things necessarily. But the other thing is not all these compounds are carcinogenic or dangerous. And when they do studies on rats, often they're not measuring cancer, they're measuring surrogate markers of these compounds. So that usually means collecting their urine or their faecal material. And the assays they use to, to study the urine or the faeces don't necessarily discriminate between all these compounds. So there's certainly a measurement issue there in some of these studies. And once again, rats are fed much higher doses of these compounds in these studies than the human diet, so it's really difficult to extrapolate this lab data to what we are doing in the real world. Now, the IARC report doesn't mention this at all, but I think it's worth touching on briefly, and that's the issue of meat quality. So as was mentioned earlier today, grass-fed meat compared to grain-fed meat tends to have a higher omega-3 level and a lower omega-6 level, and this, is, this graph shows some local data on some cows, but it's been replicated in many countries around the world. Grass-fed meat tends to have higher levels of vitamin A and vitamin E precursors as well, um, and overall lower fat content as well. So when I get asked in the clinic, should I buy grass-fed meat, then my answer is generally if it's practical or if it's possible, yes. The other issue to touch on briefly is the issue of environmental contaminants. So in the same way that people worry about where the fish comes from and whether there's high levels of mercury in the water or lead and all that sort of thing, there's some evidence that where our livestock is raised and how they're fed might... Uh, affect the quality of the meat. And certainly there's some data out of Europe showing that um, in particular livestock animals can accumulate some of these organic compounds, particularly in their fat tissue, where they, where they can then make their way uh, to our plate. So it's not an area that's studied particularly well. I don't think there's any uh, local data on this, but it probably warrants some research in the future. Now I'm going to come back to this study that I flagged earlier. So this is the Adventist study which found a, a correlation between red meat and cancer. This is the final paragraph of that study. So what they said is they found this particularly high risk of colorectal cancer in patients who ate lots of red meat and who were obese and didn't eat legumes. And what they said is this raises the possibility that it's not just the red meat that's mediating all this, but it might be involved in a constellation of causal factors that produce higher plasma insulin levels. So that's interesting. Is there any data to suggest, to suggest that? There is actually. So this diagram shows you the multiple different ways that type 2 diabetes, obesity and hyperinsulinemia uh, can cause cancer or, or promote tumour cell growth. So 
Obesity uh, causes inflammation in the fat cells, which lead to increased uh, cytokine levels, which can directly affect, affect the tumour. Insulin has a direct uh, growth effect on tumour cells, and also an indirect uh, growth effect via hyperglycemia and via upregulation of IGF-1 and IGF-1 receptors. Insulin also acts on the liver to reduce the circulating levels of sex hormone binding globulin, which leads to increased amounts of bioavailable estrogen, and that's linked to a higher risk of breast cancer and endometrial cancer. And somewhat separate to all of that, on the far left, you can see the multiple potential effects on the intestinal gut microbiome and its role in producing inflammatory cytokines and mediating further inflammation, which can promote tumour cell growth. So that's strong mechanistic data. And what does that look like in the real world? It looks like this. So type 2 diabetes is a major risk factor for cancer. So this slide shows you several meta-analyses looking at not just colorectal cancer, but a variety of different cancers and the risk compared to a non-diabetic if you're a diabetic. And what you'll see is the relative risks we're talking about here in almost all the cases are well in excess of 1.18. Similar story with obesity and cancer. So colonic cancer, again, has a higher risk than 1.18 in patients, both in male and female. But there's also other cancers that are strongly related. So esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is very closely linked with gastroesophageal reflux, which often gets better when people lose weight. And also endometrial cancer, as I mentioned before, the effects of uh, high levels of circulating estrogen uh, certainly increase the risk of getting endometrial cancer quite significantly. So I put these slides up to highlight that we really should be assessing people's individual cancer risk. So just telling everyone to not eat red meat might not be the ideal way to go. And for a lot of my patients in the clinic who have severe metabolic derangement or diabetes, I try to stress to them that they've got bigger uh, concerns when it comes to their cancer risk. So in conclusion, red meat's been consistently associated with a consistently small increase in colorectal cancer risk in meta-analyses. This is only on the basis of observational data, which, as I've mentioned, has many limitations. There are several confounding factors, including the processing of the meat contaminants and how the meat is cooked. And it's, never, it's also important to note, it's never really been tested in a Western population of low-carbohydrate meat eaters either. And there are bigger risks to be aware of in, your, in terms of your cancer risk, especially if you're overweight, obese, or a type 2 diabetic. And at the end of the day, a nutrient-dense, whole food-based diet is what we should be recommending to patients for optimal health, and that includes high-quality red meat. So thank you, and hopefully some of you will be tucking into a, red, a nice steak tonight.